what I'd like to do is basically have a brief trot through uh, a few points about QE. I'm not a fan of unconventional monetary policy at all. I don't believe that central banks should engage in wild monetary experimentation on the off chance that they get it right. I don't believe that at all. Um, so what I propose to do is have a quick trot through US monetary policy. Two of my headlines are, first off, I don't believe that ZERP is stimulative. Um, and secondly, I think QE is best interpreted as preferential credit allocation, i.e. a big Wall Street bailout. Hmm. And the third point that I haven't put in my slide is that um, I think we, we are starting to see that monetary policy, that this kind of monetary policy is associated with, and I, I suspect there is a causality here, with a collapse of productivity growth. And this is something that's extremely disturbing and we need to sort of look further into it. And at the end, I'd like to uh, offer some thoughts on why I think the alternatives, you know, really finishing off from where Diana left off, is, is where are we heading? I think we're heading into the woods and it's getting darker and darker and there's more and more dangerous things lurking there. Um, so, just to start with uh, some charts. Sorry, the charts. I can't see the bottom, but I just thought I'd just go through, get my stylized facts broadly right. So that's, this is MZM growth rate, and we see it, it, it dips uh, in May 2010. Uh, <coughs> then we have the real economic growth rate. Oh dear, this is going to get a bit. Um, it's dipping further, as you can see. Um, but it's interesting that it reflects what Tim said, that, that essentially the nominal and the, uh, that the monetary and, and the real, thank you, uh, the monetary and the nominal growth reflect each other to consider it. I think this is real. But the dip is, is somewhat, um, the monetary dips about a year after the real. And so you get the same sort of dips, but a sort of time sequence that's a bit, it's not my <coughs> understanding of mainstream monetarism. Um, that's something we can think about. When we go to other indications, spending, we see something similar to real growth. Bank lending, I think, is a key one. And, and what impresses me is that it was some six years before bank lending in the United States recovered in real, real, uh, in real terms. And I think the bank lending story is obviously critical to what we're trying to get a handle on. So obviously, therefore, it's no wonder I would say that the uh, recovery was so anemic. And uh, moving on, the CPI, I'm sorry I was fast, fast asleep and I copied the MZM onto that instead of the CPI, so we'll move on to that. <laughs> <laughs> Close uh, correlation. 100% correlation. <laughs> I couldn't believe I made a mistake like that. Anyway, so key points, we got that the monetary aggregates lag the crisis. There was a spending crash in late 2008, the dips in second quarter of 2009. <coughs> the natural the question is what caused the spending crash? Well, I would say, obviously, it had something to do with the shock of the global financial crisis. And so therefore the question is what was going on and especially why was bank lending so weak and for so long. So then what I want to do is to look further at ZERP and QE. Now, ZERP basically... So oh, encourage what ZERP means. Oh, sorry. Uh, zero interest rate policy. Um, so basically, for a starter, it encourages greater risk-taking via pushing people into search for yield, which I think is a dangerous thing, which increases risk taking and is often not appropriate for certain uh, investors, especially uh, pensions, or some, some pension savers. And to state the obvious, it encourages more borrowing, higher leverage, greater fiscal profligacy, and delays restructuring. Um, so there's a lot of companies out there that really shouldn't be out there. They should have been exterminated some time ago. Um, it reduces financial returns, 
and long term has a devastating impact on savers and pension funds. So what you're seeing here is the power of the law of compound interest. I did a back of the envelope calculation. If you, if you have a decade of zero interest rates rather than 3% interest rates, the, that has a 27% effect on the value of your pension fund at the end of that decade. That's pretty devastating. So in the, long, in the short term, it's, it's one thing, but in the long term, the long term catches up with you. Um, now, I think very important that zero interest rates reduce bank profitability, for example, via lower net interest margins. And bank profitability is further reduced when you have flattening yield curve, which means this, the strategy of borrowing short to lend long no, no longer delivers. So putting these together, I conclude the ZERP is not stimulative. It reduces bank lending also via a reduced incentive to lend. It fails to boost spending via reduced saving. And in fact, uh, saving, the, saving, the US savings rate has nearly doubled since 2007. So it's hard to see where the stimulative channel actually is. Now I go further and I would say that central bankers are stuck in a ZERP trap that they, they implement ZERP thinking it's stimulative and then keep trying, keep trying it in a futile attempt to produce a stimulus that ZERP cannot produce. But they haven't quite, they're like trapped in some kind of Alice in Wonderland fantasy world. Until they realise the error of that thinking, they're going to be trapped there forever. So, what about QE? Well, the stated purpose as I understand it, it was to reduce long-term yields and to boost investment spending, etc., etc. Fair enough. However, I would say that the combination of QE plus interest on excess reserves is best seen as preferential asset allocation policy. And in this context, I would heartily recommend papers by Larry White. Uh, for example, in the Cato Journal this year, he has a lovely phrase where he says that QE was overreaching, wasteful, morally hazardous, I love that phrase, and fraught with serious governance problems. Now, to spell out the obvious, that Fed-directed asset allocation is akin to central planning, creates deadweight losses, encourages lobbying and cronyism and bad things like that. So, the net result is I see targeted assistance as essentially a form of fiscal policy or implemented by the Fed. There's little impact on growth, which is fairly clear, I think, and it provides little benefit except to Wall Street. It also killed the urgency for Congress to confront major structural problems, including especially with the bank <coughs> I would also say that the Fed the Fed spins it as a, t as a tool to help Main Street, but QE is actually the greatest Wall Street bailout of all time. So, as an aside, you might say, well, okay, smart Alec, well, what should the Fed have done? <laughs> well, I would have suggested a moderate but not aggressive easing using more traditional approaches, <coughs> let the weak banks <coughs> fail, have contingency plans for systemic problems, and extract the price, mm. accountability, liability uh, on the part of bankers who make these decisions. And this is where I think Tim and I <coughs> disagree, or we agree on many other things. I think that they should have implemented measures to, to raise capital requirements. I'm not interested in the risk weighted asset. I'm talking about proper capital to asset ratio. We could get into that. And of course, there are other factors as well. You have essentially unbridled discretion, implying government and central bank lawlessness, no less, um, and regime uncertainty. I know that George has written a piece recently essentially saying that the Fed is breaking the law. I think it's done it many, many times. And of course, we also have the impact of greater regulation, including Basel III, which I think is a monstrosity, and the Dodd Frank Act. So, moving on. So what we have then is a failure of stimulus to stimulate, 
And there's a whole ton of indicators that you can point to. So we have a slowdown in economic growth. We have job creation down to 0.5%. Participation ratio rate down. U6 unemployment in the United States is almost 10%. That, that's double the official rate. That is not full employment. Real income growth is stagnant for most people. And media, the median peak was last attained in 1990. By my copy, that's 26 years ago. So something funny is going on. We see a, a slowdown in small business creation down to 8%. And astonishingly, there were reports that most US households have very low or even zero savings. So they say they are extremely vulnerable to the next downturn, which is not good news at all. And then, of course, we have you know, rising inequality. And again, this is well documented. So we're looking at transfers from the poor and the savers to the high net worth types and Wall Street. And last but not not least, we have the collapse of productivity growth. Now, productivity growth was about 3% up to 1973. It then halved in the period to 2010. I think we can put that down, a lot of it, to regulation. There was a lot of regulation in the 70s. And then it's been 0.5% in the United States since 2010 is now negative. It's a little better in Europe, not much better, and it's worse in Japan. So the question is, this is a really interesting question, why is this? Well, this is not Robert Gordon-style secular stagnation, because the time frame is wrong. So the, uh, it just happened too quick, in my opinion. A hint at this is uh, given by this chart, which is, um, Thing is, yeah, private non residential fixed investment in real terms. And you can see that this it took a very long time to recover to its pre crisis level. But a lot of the, the, the rubbish investment, you know, the, the, the sort of unproductive, real, you know, pointless real estate, bridges to nowhere, and so forth, it's going to come out of this. So what's left is the investment that is labor supporting. So I think this is telling us something, <coughs> but I, I would welcome further discussion. So the tentative conclusion is that Sassane Zerk crowds out investments that promote labour productivity, and labour productivity ultimately drives wage rates. Now, Mr. Draghi in April says there is little alternative to, monetary, to money printing and low rates when prospects are dim. Now the problem is, we've already been awash with stimulus and low rates for nearly a decade and it ain't working. So common sense suggests that if it doesn't work, move on. So one is reminded of the man, that, you know, they say that uh, to a man with a hammer every problem looks like a nail. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. So the failure of aggressive easing does not argue for its expansion, but for its cessation. Let's stop and have another think also why I think this conference is so well. I think now going on to my sort of scare story, I think current policies are unsustainable. The central banks cannot suppress risks indefinitely. A portfolio built to withstand central bank stress is one destined to blow up spectacularly. Now think of a carry trade. We all know that carry trades are very safe until they blow up in your face and then you wish you hadn't done it. Experience also suggests that risks are lowest, are greatest, when the measured risks are lowest. Okay. So we also have, on top of that, a relentless buildup of debt. So we haven't had much deleveraging, to put it mildly. And debt, of course, is a major headwind and implies, among other things, that central banks have little ammo to counter a downturn. But it gets worse, I think. Um, the Fed has to raise interest rates. But one question is, how can it raise interest rates? It doesn't seem to have the mechanism to do so. Okay, you can, in, you can increase interest on excess reserves and push up Fed funds. But Fed funds is disconnected from the market, so how, does that, how do we get market interest rates up there? There's some major problems. 
and Jerry Jordan has done some very good work on this. I did look back at the envelope calculation and 100 basis points rise would easily trigger losses of trillions. Okay, depend, you, know, you just do a basic duration analysis. On top of which, markets are highly correlated. And the only risk that matters is the 10-year treasury. So if you had a, a, a decent interest rate hike, the chances are all the bubbles would burst. Treasuries, job, equities, real estate, the lot. And you have to bear in mind, and this is the bad news, that many positions are poorly hedged. They have to be poorly hedged because you can't calibrate a hedge strategy or risk models if you don't have any data. And when you have data of basically almost no movement in interest rates, you can't calibrate the hedge, you can't calibrate your risk model. Anyway, the risk models are useless anyway. They're typically based <laughs> on value at risk and Gaussianity, and we know they don't work. And then, of course, there's the danger of a positive feedback loop. So let's suppose that the markets take a downturn. The VAR models all then issue sell orders, essentially. And so you're selling on a, down, on, a, on, a, on a falling market just exacerbates the loop. So the bottom line is that the Fed is trapped. It needs to raise rates, but it can't. And the clock is ticking as misallocations and hidden risks build, build further up. So basically, well done, Fed. <laughs> um, so what are we going to do? My worry is it's going to get even more bizarre. So we're in the, we're in the frying pan, so let's jump out. So we're looking at two <coughs> possibilities, ramping QE, no banning cash, and helicopter money. And this is where we're heading at. The good news about ramping up QE, well it's good news if you're not uh, Japanese, is that it's already <coughs> been tried in Japan, and I think it, it's fair to say that it failed. I mean, this is in three years, they've, gone, they've tripled the size of the, of the balance sheet relative to GDP. So it, that's a bloody good experiment. And if it doesn't work in Japan, we have to wonder, we have to doubt whether it would work anywhere else. <coughs> now, the failure of Japanese QE, well, minimal impact on growth, plummeting productivity now, not, not falling productivity growth, we're talking about negative productivity growth. You also have to consider the major adverse effects of the huge Bank of Japan balance sheet. They're running out the bonds to buy. Traditional credit analysis no longer matters. The banks are buying negative yielding bonds, not because they want to hold them to maturity, but they want to sell them on to the Bank of Japan. So you have the sort of the greater fool theory, where the greater, greatest fool on the planet is the Bank of Japan. See. So this is what is actually happening now. In addition, the Bank of Japan is becoming a big shareholder, which means the, 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 the stock market is becoming detached from fundamentals. Uh, so for example, if the Bank of, Bank of Japan is essentially buying up everything, but how is it going to do all the government stuff that a good shareholder <coughs> should do, etc., etc.? So what we're looking at is a ginormous bubble where in the limit, the Bank of Japan will have bought up anything. So it's a kind of nationalization by other means. Now, Japanese policymakers are fixated on stimulus to, to a, a, an extent that nobody else is. This is why the yen is strengthening and inflation is falling. Why? Because the policies are not, in fact, stimulative. Now, Governor Kuroda last, last year had this lovely quote where he says, he quotes Peter Pan, which is a great thing for a central banker to do. He says, the moment you start to doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. Well, just in case nobody noticed, Peter Pan is a fictional children's character. But when Icarus tried it, it didn't work. So it's very dangerous. Um, but I think it shows you how deluded uh, the Japanese central bankers are becoming. Now, look at what they're talking about now. They're, they're, they're trying to peg 10-year yields. And there are proposals for the BOJ to forgive all outstanding government debt. Now, call me, call me a <coughs> skeptic, but it seems to me that all the remaining constraints against overissue are being kicked away, and this can only end one way. We all know what that is. So what about NERP? Well, in the first place, you can see NERP as the extension of ZERP. But 
People who propose no don't stop, to, to, don't pause to ask why ZERP isn't working. So in, in my view, it's even more anti-stimulative, and for one very obvious reason, it's a tax. So we tell me, you know, no tax is ever stimulative. To my, there might be one I missed, but I'm not aware of it. <laughs> but in addition, NERP kills lending. Because why would anyone want to lend, to, to lend at a negative rate? Okay. But even worse, NERP would destroy the financial system. You see, the banks, pension funds, hedge funds, asset manage, management firms, they all become unviable. So however strong they might be, sustained ZERP will kill them and they're not very strong in the first place. And last but not least, no is an offence against the law of positive time preference, and we all know that. So, the next, the next uh, proposal is that we should ban cash. Now, I've got very strong feelings on this. Um, you see, the problem is that if you wanted to implement full-blooded nerve, then people will react by, um, by running to cash. So we stopped them uh, running to cash by banning cash. That was really clever. So and now the, the Ken Rogoff stuff, you know, the bad guys use it and so on. Yeah, but bad, we all use cash. So why do we take any, any amenity of any sort, the paper clips, for example, and ban them because the bad guys might use them? It, it just it's very, very heavy handed and not thought through. In any case, a recent Bank of England report says that, in fact, that argument is overstated because the main risk uh, from, um, you know, people, you know, what is it, illicit transfers of money is through the banking system, which is regulated. So it's regulatory failure, it's not cash. Anyway, uh, from a civil libertarian point of view, banning cash leaves, leaves individuals at the mercy of the state. The state can then control every transaction. So you can't hide, you can't resist, and you can't escape. And essentially, you're throwing away financial privacy, which is a <coughs> basic human right. I think that this is extremely dangerous. And then last but not least, the best one of all, helicopter money. Now, first point, helicopter money fosters the illusion of a free lunch. And if, if policy makes, you know, so Congress thinks, oh, we don't have to raise taxes, we don't have to issue debt, well, this is great. So, you know, your favorite project, you know, suddenly gets financed. You cannot have rational policy making on the assumption that there are free lunches all over the place. But that's what it implies. It also has major redistributive elements because it encroaches on fiscal policy. This will undermine central bank independence. What's left of it, because obviously the Congress would essentially turn around at some point and say, well, we'll just have to put the Fed in its place because this is congressional uh, uh, area of responsibility and not responsibility of some government-sponsored enterprise like the Fed. It also would destroy the last remaining constraint against the awful issue of money. Because basically, if, if it's perceived that this money is free, the demand for free money will be infinite, and then we're finished. And one of my favorite quotes on this is by Ottmar Issing. And I do think we should pay attention to the Germans on this. Um, and he has a lovely quote in, in uh, Süddeutsch Zeitung a few months ago, and he said, it's nothing less than a monetary policy declaration of bankruptcy. The world is being meddled into chaos that cannot be described. And all I can say is I'm into that. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>